Hello, and welcome back to the Video Essay Podcast. I'm your host, Will DeGravio. On today's episode, I am so excited to be joined by Alison Pierce, a horror film scholar and professor at the University of Leeds in the UK. Alison is the leader of the project Doing Women's Global Horror Film History, a year-long video essay mentoring and training program that recently culminated in a videographic special issue of the scholarly journal MAI, My Feminism and Visual Culture. DWGHFH, the acronym of the project, features the work of 30 collaborators who are working on, to quote Allison's website, women horror filmmakers in non-Anglophone countries with a particular focus on filmmakers from the global majority. On this episode, we discuss the origins of the project, how Allison went about soliciting contributors and mentors, and we get into a whole lot more. As always, you can learn more about this podcast at thevideoessay.com, and please follow us on social media channels and subscribe to our free newsletter, Notes on Videographic Criticism, at thevideoessay.substack.com. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with the one and only Allison Pierce. joined by one of the most wonderful people I've had the pleasure of meeting in my years in the video essay world. Um, the one and only Allison Pierce joins us. Allison, welcome to the video essay podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Will. Um, it means a lot that you've invited me um, to be interviewed and to talk about my new project. It feels, it feels very special, so thank you. Of course. <laughs> and this project... Um, doing women's global horror film history been in the works i think really since i've first met you a couple of years ago um so it's really exciting to to have you here but for those allison is an incredibly <laughs> prolific person so i'll ask you to just introduce yourself with okay. the like, you know give us a sense of kind of who you are and your your kind of scholarly and artistic background that kind of brought you to this point with the caveat that we couldn't cover everything Oh my, of course not. I mean, <laughs> so prolific. Um, so I'm a professor of film studies and I'm based at the University of Leeds in the UK. And for those that know British accents, they'll also realise that I am originally from Leeds as well. So it's very nice to come home to my home city to live and work. Um, my specialism is horror film. I've done now like four books, edited collections around horror um, that's always been my thing. My PhD was 1930s horror film, and I've just kept on the horror film bent since then, really. Um, I've always wanted to make video essays, though. Um, I trained as a film scholar doing psychoanalytic film theory, and I still love pens and paper, but I loved video essays, but I don't consider myself a technical person. And I just like, well, if I can't do technical stuff, I can't do video essays. So for years and years, I just watched them. And then I was putting in for a big grant from the UK funding body, the AHRC. And I thought, bugger it, this is a time when I'm going to go for it and put some about video essays in. So I applied for funding from the AHRC to do Middlebury in 2022. I'm saying it properly here because, again, with my accent, you'd say Middlebury. But when I said Middlebury, while I was at Middlebury, no one knew what I was talking about. Um, so I got funding to go to Middlebury in 2022. And that's really where my video essay kind of journey began, like it is for so many people. In your in introduction to this, you know, to, to this project, which was just published in the journal uh, MAI, um, you, you talk about how this project really appeals to so many different folks, right? Like you could come to this project as a horror fan, as a feminist film scholar, as a videographic critic, as some intersection of all three. And, but one of the things that I was wondering was like, what was, what were some of like the early video essays that you were, you were watching? Yes, um, indeed. Um, very unsurprisingly, it was Katie Grant. <laughs> 
I'm sorry to be like so boring. Uh, like I'm sure everyone just says Katie, but I do have like a genuine reason. So when I did my PhD, um, I did it on gender and genre in horror film. And I was supervised by Professor Annette Kuhn, who's like, you know, one of the founding people of film studies and feminist film studies. And I've always stayed in touch with Annette and stayed friends with Annette afterwards. And it was a about five years ago, I was around at Annette's house because she only lives about an hour north of me. And, and she was like, look at this, look at this amazing thing. And it was a video essay that Katie had made for her in response to one of her journal articles. So the very first, I mean, I'd seen bits of video essays and stuff online, but the first one that really struck me was Interplay by Catherine Grant. So Annette had, um, so Interplay is a tribute to Annette Kuhn's work on psychoanalysis and cinema. And Interplay was made in response to her work. And Annette was absolutely delighted and overwhelmed and she showed me it and says look at this and I watched it and I've never seen anything like that before and I just thought oh this is wonderful but I also thought I couldn't even begin to imagine how I would go about making that and that that was very much where my brain sat for a few years until I got this funding opportunity and I was like I'm going to apply to Middlebury they probably won't take me but I'm just going to try and see what happens and then Middlebury is the point where my brain cracked up and I think where's videographic work yes you know you never looked back and now we're no. and now I we're mean, here <laughs> I mean you'd know Will you were there looking after me so <laughs> <laughs> and you made so and you made amazing things and 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 continue to do so um and, you know, and but, you know, putting back your horror scholar hat, or maybe they're not two separate hats, you know, the, you know not really. Um, but in your introduction to the to the special issue, you do a great job of, like, taking us inside how you you thought about the project and how you conceived it. Um, and you you kind of write this survey of what you had seen as the existing scholarship on women's horror filmmaking. And to quote you here, you write that while we had a wonderful surge in scholarship on women horror filmmakers, much of it did not speak to or from the experiences of women filmmakers of the global majority. And so this, you know, this project is in 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 scale and ambition, and everything, it really feels like, you know, you, you thought a lot about how you're positioning it within kind of these, uh, the existing work being done in the field. So I'm wondering if you collaborate more collaborate if you could elaborate more uh on that for us and take us inside your thinking thank you um and i'm pleased it comes across in my introduction to this project that i really did a lot of thinking about it and um, i always have a lot of ideas and often part of my problem is trying to work out which of these ideas can go together and can multiple ideas multiple strands work within one coherent project and it's something I was really thinking about for this global horror project and um, I just on a side note um when I named this doing women's global horror film history I was speaking to the existing work on women's film history in the book doing women's film history and then I was like yeah but I want to make it more global and more about horror so I just added global and horror but I did all this on my own sat at the computer without ever really thinking about how the acronym DWGFHF is impossible to say out loud. Um, so I really regret <laughs> not an acronym that I can actually say. Um, so people call it all sorts of things, which is fair enough. Um, but yeah, so my background is horror. Um, I've always been interested in the gendering of genre um, so I've always been interested in um, feminism and also how women and men are represented on screen in horror films. And in 2020, I published Women Make Horror, Filmmakers, Feminism and Genre, which was kind of one of the key books of the new wave of work on women filmmakers. I'm really happy with that book. But as I was kind of watching more and more work come out afterwards, I realised that it the most of the work that was coming out was around contemporary films and contemporary filmmakers. And then 
which is understandable. And then more to the point, it was predominantly North American and British filmmakers, and then very occasionally a French director. And it's like, because my background's film history, like my, as I say, my first book was on the 1930s. My PhD actually began on European silent cinema. I was just like, there's, we need to do more on like the history It isn't just that all these women filmmakers suddenly emerged from 2010 onwards. Like this, this isn't the case. There wasn't basically Pet Cemetery 1987 and then nothing till 2010. So I was thinking about that. And then at the same time, I was thinking it, it, it isn't, it's not even that it can't be. It isn't just white Western Anglophone or Francophone filmmakers. This can't be. This, this has to be addressed. Like we've got such um, a wonderful plurality of filmmaking all around the world and across sort of a century of horror cinema. And the work that I was reading was great, but it, it, it wasn't going enough into the areas that I was interested in. And that's when I found the term global majority, which is um, a term coined by Rosemary Campbell Stevens. And she uses it to refer to people who are black, African, Asian, brown, Arab and mixed heritage are indigenous to the global south and or have been racialized as ethnic minorities. And Campbell Stevens points out this represents about 85 percent of the world's population. So it's like, well, all of this makes sense to me. So why don't I try when I put this project together to focus on global majority filmmaking and try and extend the remit of the work on women's filmmaking to be not just contemporary, but to have more of a a historical approach as well. So that's where I began to think about the horror side of things. You write, and this is a phrase that I hadn't been familiar with, so it was great to encounter it in, in your work. You write that you wondered what might a reparative mode look like in this context for the subject at this point in time? Um, and I'm wondering, could you just elaborate more on, again, on kind of what that is and how it informed the way you thought about, you thought about this? Well, this is the thing, like, I'm quite a cheerful, like, positive person as a rule, as I, as I hope you know, Will. I was thinking about Eve Kozowski Sedgwick's work. She's got a very famous, very famous essay called Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, or You're So Paranoid, You Probably Think This Essay Is About You. And it's um, a canonical essay and also very complex and has almost created a whole dynasty of academic scholarship about paranoid versus reparative reading. But the kind of the broad strokes is what I didn't want to do with this project would be the paranoid reading, which is pointing out all the gaps and all the failures and all the flaws and kind of wagging a finger saying, look, everybody's doing it wrong. Um, What I wanted to do was work more in the reparative mode, which very broad strokes would be to approach a subject with interest and love and nurture and think about how can we develop it more? What are the places and spaces that we can celebrate and enjoy and approach it with that more positive, inclusive, generative mindset? I would say, rather than just going, everybody's wrong, which I don't think is is super helpful for getting people on board. There's also the logistics <laughs> side of things, <laughs> oh, which yeah. I'm just as like, on the one hand, I'm in awe of like the 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 theory that you bring and how you thought about this. Then the other, I'm trying to think about like, what must Alison's spreadsheet have been like? like what <laughs> like what was going on? Because it it's you know you ended up with you describe in the piece thir- thirty pieces. And it grew in size and scope. And so I, I want to kind of describe for people who maybe are listening in and are maybe wanting to tackle maybe something similar in a project in their field of scholarship or something. Can you take us into that logistics process? I guess starting be- beginning with how you solicited submissions and how you kind of went through them and and thought about building this project with all these wonderful folks. Um, Yeah, of course. It's been a very iterative process. I didn't really know how it would work. 
Um, to start with, it was part of the funding bid that I put to the AHRC. So as well as going to Middlebury, it was to do this special issue. Um, but when I pitched it, I thought, mm, I can't imagine that many people will be interested. Um, I'll say maybe six people want to do it and, you know, we'll work on that case. And then I didn't even really know how it would work. So what I essentially wanted to do with this project wasn't just create a special issue entirely of video essays and supporting statements, although that's what it is, but it was to train people. Like my experience in learning the basics of how to make video essays and working at Middlebury just like blew my brain open. And again, I was so influenced by Katie Grant, who's very self-effacing and very humble. And it's always about like, it's not about the latest tech and the most powerful computer. It's about your thoughts and your thinking and your process. And I wanted to like almost be a cheerleader for that and even in the call for papers I put on the my website it says like essentially even if you're terrified if you want to do this but you're terrified and have no technical experience you're the person to do this because there's so many great thinkers out there who don't know where to begin with kind of practical making so I put together a call for papers that said I want to do this special issue that is composed entirely of video essays and written statements on women filmmakers working in the horror genre. Um, At that point, I put um, my preference is for countries that have been marginalised in discourse, so I particularly highlighted like Africa, Middle East, Latin America, etc. And I said, this will be comprised of like a year-long training programme that will take place online and will be free and will work on the assumption that you only have access to free software. So again, I didn't want money to be a barrier. So if you have Premiere Pro, great. If you don't, great. Like you can work on any platform. And for the free software, we decided on Shotcut because I know there are some excellent and like high powered free software out there, but some people will have been working on like really like shanky old computers. So it needed to be something that they could work with. So I put a call for papers out on the my website and circulated it on a few of the academic mailing lists that usually come out. And I thought, mm, I don't, and on social media, I shouted about it quite a lot. I thought, I don't know if anyone's going to go for this. And it was like that feeling when you have a party and you're worried that nobody's going to (laughs) come. It's just like, like I had no standing in the video essay community at all at any point. I hadn't done middle bit by that point, I don't think. No, I hadn't. I don't even think I'd been accepted. So it was very much just out in the kind of horror and film studies networks. And then I ended up getting over 100 submissions. So that... That was insane. Um, And then the main problem I then faced with, well, there were two problems. The first one was I couldn't just take six people because that would be crazy. Um, And there were so many excellent ones from specifically the kind of regions I was interested in. But then at the same time, even though I'd said I was really interested in essentially global majority filmmaking, the majority of the work I was getting in was contemporary kind of white western filmmakers and I I as I said I think in other platforms I love Jennifer's body I I really love Jennifer's body but I don't ever need to see any more academic work on Jennifer's body like we're done the same for Raw um the same for Pet Cemetery. they're all films that I adore but I, I we don't need any more academic work on them so I selected about half So I ended up taking 40 people on the training. Of of that, 27 made it through or 26, which is a damn good hit rate for a year-long academic project. But of those, I think I took about half from the open call and the rest are just people that I went after. Because even with the open call, it's not enough. Um... 
you know, if there are certain areas that you need to fill as an editor, it's up to you to essentially get off your ass and go fill it yourself because the people will come to you. It's kind of, it's not like Wayne's World 2, if you book them, they will come. Like, you have to go find people. So I was like, right, there's nothing coming in on mainland Chinese filmmaking. Right, who are the big scholars in mainland Chinese filmmaking who are interested in horror? Right, have a look at their profiles cold email them and pitch them the project so around half of the contributors I cold emailed and sold the project to and that's how we've got such a good range of people really and it was the same for women make horror as well though like if there's some kind of area you really want covering then you need to go find the people and explain to them why it's worth their time working with you so that was kind of where I got the contributors and I had to sit down and work out how do I train people who are all over the world. So we had people right from Danielle over in Hawaii, who was minus 11 GMT to me. Then people right over to Melbourne, who I think were plus 11 GMT. And like, as I say, nearly 40 people. It's like, hmm, don't really know how this will work. So I sat down with Miriam Kent, who we'd recently appointed as an academic at Leeds, where I work, and we put together an online technical training program with a strand for those who could access Premier Pro and a strand for those who had Shotcut. And we we did a big form that went out to everyone first, which was like, what's your technical setup? What do you have experience with? You don't need any experience, don't panic. Um, Like, how are you planning to do this? All those kinds of things. Even down to, do you have headphones? Like, we were working on that level. Um, And so Miriam and I put together a technical, a series of technical training videos that Miriam recorded and devised based on the Middlebury model. And um, we uploaded those and then Miriam did live workshops where they made the petriculture and the voiceover and the epigraph and things like that. So the beginning of the programme was very much an emphasis on the technical training. Then we started to get into masterclasses. So that's when I brought in such geniuses as Katie Grant and Dana McLeod um, to talk more about conceptual and important things to think about when making video essays. And then as the um, contributors began to actually make stuff, we also added in Evelyn Kreutzer, which was fantastic. And Evelyn did regular online live workshops with small groups where everybody shared their work in advance and then came on and talked about it. So it was a mix of pre-recorded technical training plus live technical workshops plus live peer mentoring sessions, plus live masterclasses, which were then also recorded and made available. So it was, it was crazy. And I kept, I kept feeling like every new stage, like I needed to invent what the next stage would be. Because I'm like, right, how do I do the next bit? I don't know. And then trying to work it out. So it's, it's, it ended up taking a year as well. Because um, I tried to be responsive to the contributors' needs. And as I went to Middlebury and I learned a bit more about videographic criticism, trying to alter and adapt the secret schedule that me, Miriam and Evelyn knew about behind the scenes to make sure it was like responsive because I can sit here not knowing anything about video essays and invent a programme, but it doesn't mean it's the right one, so. We are going to, on the Video Essay Podcast, have um, subsequent episodes on this project where we have, you know, creators have, you know, talk about their work and their experience, but without kind of um, speaking for anyone in the project, but from your perspective as the, as the organizer, the editor, what, what was like, how much, what was the experience like for someone who was participating in terms of how much were folks interacting with one another? Like, it seems like you, you, you formed a real, like, community of practice through this this project um so I'm, I'm wondering from from that aspect you know it seems very just there were so many different opportunities to engage with each other's work so what, what was that what was that like if you can as best you can take us kind of inside that yeah I can def- 
I can definitely give you um, my perspective as kind of the person running it. Um, the idea of creating a community of feminist inclined scholars who were interested in video essays and in horror film was one of the main takeaways I wanted from the project. Like projects represent one point in time and the outputs are one point in time, um, but a community can go on for, you know, forever. It's in the same way the experience of Middlebury and then more recently Bowdoin, um, by coming together and even if it's online and working together, you create bonds that you take forward for future collaborations. So for me, the way I wanted to address the contributors when I wrote to them or when we met online was through kind of a flat, non-hierarchical community and tried to make sure everybody knew it's okay to try and fail and be a bit crap and just be able to have a go. And whenever you share any work or you're embarking on something new, it's scary, but I wanted people to be okay with that. And that's what I think I tried to do. So the community for me is really important because that's what will have the legacy. I do hope that the special issue will have um, an impact and will generate more work. But the real legacy is the people coming together and meeting each other. And that's what's important because that's that's the really valuable thing. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work for everybody. Some people are more lone wolves and there were people like that on the project and they still hopefully had a good time and got something out of it. I was in um I was in Berlin last week um with May Santiago and we were doing a live launch of the project at the Final Girls Berlin Film Festival and May was talking about her experience and I won't talk too much for May but she was like yeah I know there was a community but I'm kind of I kind of just do things on my own and do my own thing so that was how I did it and again, again that's fine but I think one of the things that made me proudest about the project was seeing so many of the scholars, particularly the younger ones, um, get together outside the project and produce conference panels on video essays. Or one of them um, sent me a photo, Uche sent me a photo where like four or five of them had all got together at a big horror film conference and taken a picture with each other. And I felt like very happy and very maternal at the same time. So that that for me is crucial and I think in any of the projects I do now building community is one of the major things and building more to the point like a feminist ethical caring community that's sort of where I'm at now you know obviously we you know anyone listening in should go to the website and learn more about all of these creators and 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 their backgrounds and you've already mentioned that they you know transcended time zones and and things like that but were was everyone involved kind of within academia or were there folks with you know uh maybe more like like a filmmaking background like what was kind of the general like you know what what was what was that kind of like the demographic was really mixed and again that is also something important for me you know I am an academic I am friends with some academics, but, you know, academics don't represent the be all and the end all of knowledge and experience. So it, I wanted to get like a plurality of point of views in there. So we did have academics on the program and um, the academics tended to be more junior and um, perhaps PhD students. Um, often I think maybe they're not entirely broken and institutionalized yet like you are by the time you're a professor like myself um, and also they were looking to skill up for the job market so I did tend to get more junior academics which was brilliant um, but I absolutely went after people whose work I admired who were working independently as film critics so Tori Potenza I specifically targeted as someone I wanted to work on the project and then um, Tori's based in the States and has done an amazing piece on a Uruguayan film which I just adore and I showed the other week in Berlin and um, also people who are filmmakers first and foremost 
independent filmmakers usually. So Birdie, one of our contributors, is actually doing an MFA in San Francisco, but is first and foremost a um, filmmaker. Or Quan Zhang, who's based in Beijing, is a filmmaker, kind of AI extraordinaire. And so I wanted to get a range of different perspectives into the programme because where and how you work and study impacts the way you see the world. So why would I only want to get one point of view? And so I, I imagine then that, so for some of these folks, this might've been their first time publishing in like an academic context. Um, and so kind of a two-part question, like, or I'll, I'll start with this. So there's also written statements that accompany the, the videos. And so, and I think you mentioned earlier, that was kind of always part of the plan. So did you all discuss kind of writing for a scholarly journal in, in, in this respect? Like, was that part of the, the process and what yeah. was that like? Yeah. Yeah. So this goes back to the demographic mix. So for the people who were academics, they were often more comfortable with the written statement and far less comfortable with the video making. Whereas the filmmakers often made breathtaking video essays, but needed a little more reassurance when it came to the written statement the make and when I say I say reassurance very specifically not that they needed help but they were less confident publishing in the academic realm so I arranged a master class which was led by Nipa Majumdar who is you know wonderful video essayist and in transition board member and I asked Nipa to reflect upon and talk about her experience as an in transition editor of what written statements can be and the way, and everybody, all the contributors took that differently. Um, so some people have turned in very academic, very scholarly statements. Some people have turned in um, very personal, short statements. Some um, like Amy Nisa, who was working on a Pakistani filmmaker who produced a film called The Cat Beast from 1997. Um, Amy's work is a mix of both personal and scholarly that I think is particularly lovely. Um, so people's preconceptions of what it needed to be and what it was varied dramatically. So I think Nipa's masterclass was really helpful in kind of reassuring people. And I, I, they all got feedback. They, most of them went through multiple drafts because I am a hardcore editor. Um, and my framework was often, I want you to give more context for the woman filmmaker, particularly if the piece was more experimental. Um, give some context to the woman filmmaker and give some context for why you've made it. So I was always try trying to urge towards the researched and the lived, I think. And people, as I say, took that in very different directions. So the special issues, almost in its own right, just a masterclass in 19,000 different ways to approach a written statement. MAI, Feminism and Visual, visual Culture, which... If you're listening now, you, you're probably familiar with this fantastic journal. Um, but if if not, I, I'm I'm wondering. Well, one of the things I thought was interesting was in their preface to to the issue, they they describe you coming to them um, with this pitch, and like, Hi. They just, yeah, <laughs> and they 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 just they're like, oh, we're super into it. But I, I like they I wrote this down that in quotes that they had it as slightly idealistic <laughs> is how they they categorized your pitch, which I I thought was great. Um, and so what were your initial conversations like with this journal and kind of why in, in your mind did you feel that it was a, a good fit for Yeah, for this I read that too, Will, and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, they kept, they kept the bit about it being idealistic to themselves. They were very professional. Um, as part of putting in for the funding grant, um, I, I'd wanted it to go to this journal, which I call, it's spelled M-A-I, and I call it my, but I don't really know how you're supposed to say it. But I, I wrote to my saying, I, I want to put it with you. This is what I want to do. And they were like, sure, why not? Well, that was easy. But um, the main, I didn't know about the idealistic bit at that point. <laughs> they, didn't, they clearly didn't know who they were dealing yeah, with. <laughs> they clearly didn't realize that I would do it. Um, but 
their journal was always and only my choice for this project. Um, they are open access, which is incredibly important. They are really feminist. They're completely open to pieces that tonally mix um, personal and academic, which is really important to me. And they are also very feminist. And, this, and let's be clear, their website looks really beautiful. So many scholarly websites look crap, but my looks beautiful and it's filled with video essays. It's got a really flexible approach to publishing creative practice. So it just felt completely perfect. And every so often I'd email them and be like, hey, I've got my contributors and hey, we've done our first kind of term of learning. And they'd be like, sounds great. So it was all really, it was all really straightforward in the end but yeah i am still tickled by the idealism <laughs> no, their, their website is it, it all looks fantastic i remember when i like first encountering i was like it 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 really is a, such a great way to present all of these works um, yeah yeah it looks fantastic and you feel like the way that the website is designed and the way that you navigate it makes it really open and accessible to people who don't come from traditional academic backgrounds, but who are interested in this. Like not everyone who's a critical thinker decides to do a PhD, they go off and do other things. And I felt like the website and the way that it's laid out and the tone made it really open and welcoming to people from like a range of professional backgrounds. So I thought that this just felt like the right place for this project. Yeah, that kind of stuff really matters. And I, I was, and it, the, the website itself is hosting the videos, um, which is really fantastic, right? So that way you don't have to worry about the the Vimeos and the YouTubes of the world. Is that, yes. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So they're actually hosting it as well. Um, that means short term pain because it took me about three weeks to upload every single requirement for each contribution, including the video essays. But it's it's long term pleasure, isn't it? Because you know that it's safely banked within my and if your Vimeo account suddenly goes weird or Vimeo takes it offline, that has no impact on your published work. No, it's really fantastic. And what was the peer review process uh, like, because I imagine, right, that obviously takes place beyond kind of the, the editing and the feedback sessions that Evelyn's leading and all of these other things. So I guess, I mean, was that why or I guess, yeah, how did how did you present that and how did you think about it with the group? <laughs> yeah, so the peer review was still in. So even though I'm trying to be like open and inclusive and bring people with a variety of backgrounds. My is still like a rigorous peer reviewed journal. And I wanted to make sure that the work that was going to be submitted, both the written and the video essay was a, a good enough standard to be published in my. So we, the work came into me and then I would have a look at it as editor and just check that it made basic sense. This again, both the video and the statement. Does it make sense? <laughs> is it in English? Does it make sense? Um, is everything that I've asked to be submitted in there? Are the certain things I've asked in the video essay, say a title and the contributor's name? You know, all the basic stuff. Um, then it went out on peer review. Initially, I thought mine might do that for me. And I emailed them like, hey, it's nearly ready to go to peer review. And they were like, hey, you do that. And I was like, oh. Um, so it went out on peer review. And then when the um, feedback came back, that went out to the contributors. Um, everybody, everybody got feedback with suggestions for revisions. Everybody did. And then it came back in again. At that point, I think it's all going a bit hazy. It was last summer. And I think I just spent weeks locked in my office looking at it all. I think I then went through it. Yes. I then went through it and made sure it looked up to scratch and usually gave final revisions. Um, but if I still wasn't sure, at that point, I'd send it out anonymously to kind of my inner circle of videographic people that I had in this period of time accumulated post Middlebury. So if there was one that I wasn't sure if it was me being weird about it or it wasn't right, it then anonymously went out on further 
peer review. But I mean, some people, it only needed two drafts. Some people, I think it was probably seven. And I just, I just kept working with them. The majority of people needed the most work with the written statements, which is the most common um, for video essay publishing, right? Um, some people did need the most work with the videos themselves. And that was a little harder to negotiate just because I wanted to keep being encouraging because I wanted their work. But at the same time, there was kind of a certain level that I needed it to get to. And I didn't want to discourage them by keeping sending it back. So uh, I tried, it was trying to be sensitive and supportive to get some people over the line, I think. But we, we got there. We got there with everyone in the end, I think. So it went on. Yeah, I would say the whole peer review process probably took about nine months. So... <laughs> And one of the things that you mentioned in your outline as well was you, you you gave a lot of thought to how you would actually physically present the videos on the website. And I'm, I, I was really taken with this. And so I'm wondering if you could just describe for folks listening and how you, the, think, the thinking that went into that level as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like, I did li- literally feel like I was inventing every stage of this project, which made me feel quite sleepy by the end, I would say. Um, but even, so when we finally got to the point, you know, we've got, because I've also done a video essay, so there's me and 29 other contributors, so there's 30 submissions, and we've got the video essay, and it's done. And we've got the written statement and it's done. And then we've got an image, which is going to be the thumbnail. And then we've got an image, which is going to be the banner. Then I was thinking, now I need to go through all the written statements and make sure they are fully working according to my publishing guidelines. But then as I was doing that, I was thinking the publishing guidelines as an academic journal, you know, feature things like if a film is mentioned the first time it's mentioned they reference the director but part of the whole shtick of this special issue is that not many women get to be directors so there's a lot of work in the special issue on production designers and costume designers and editors so it's like I don't want to put some random guy's name in so then it's like right let's invent a new referencing system where we reference only the most senior woman which is something I always do in my video essays but I made everybody do for this whole special issue I think that's one of my things like as the editor I'm like, right, it's going to be everybody who's actually a woman who's is showcased here. So there was a lot of thinking like that. Um, and just thinking, like some of my background is screenwriting. And one of the things in screenwriting is white space, like literally the amount of white space on the page and how a screenplay runs roughly a page a minute, dialogue runs faster, action runs slower. But I wanted this to look beautiful and to have lots of white space so I was really trying to think about the statements themselves not just being appendages but offering something additional that was easy to read and enjoyable so there was that kind of level of thought going into it as well I you know I mean you could say I overthink things you could (laughs) I I I could hear you talk about it all day personally um (laughs) but you mentioned that you also made a video yes. as part of of this, and you, you are obviously a videographic critic and maker yourself. Mm, that's nice to hear. So that. So- it still feels new. But I'm, <laughs> I'm taking it. I like it. <laughs> and you know, because you were so immersed in this and 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 watching and and being in this space, I'm wondering if you could comment on the experience of watching and spending so much time with these works and how it's influenced the way that you think about your own, your own practice, you know, going forward, or even as you were creating this piece for this, this issue. Um, the piece I made um, is called how not to reproduce what we inherit, which is a Sarah Ahmed quote. Um, I, I'm a fangirl of Sarah Ahmed and my recent video essay, The Language of Rage, is also Sarah Ahmed. Um, but the whole of the video essay was um, a response to reading Sarah Ahmed and being part of this project. So I took my editor's prerogative of demanding that everybody turns their work in by a certain day and then not having even begun to think about my own. <laughs> it's just like, 
I'll do mine later. I'll do mine later. And then it's like, when does later transpire? Because you're always so busy herding everybody else through and making this behemoth of a project limp forward. You're like, when will that day come? And so it wasn't until everybody else's were pretty much completely finished that I did mine. I was like, right, I've got a couple of days to think about this. What am I going to do? And I sat and thought about what had inspired me in doing the project and the first thing was the remit of including only global majority filmmakers. And I thought I want to include short and feature length films in my video essay from every single one of the regions that are being explored in this project. And then a, a substantial minority of the contributors made experimental work. And I haven't made anything particularly experimental before. I think it's just part of developing as like a video essay maker. You start very voiceover and clips and then gradually, you know, kind of you you can something you move off in a different direction. But there were a couple of pieces like Amy Nisa's, which were super experimental and I was just blown away by what they made me feel. And it's literally like, not until I've done this video essay and this project that I started to understand like the power of experimental work, even though I've been teaching like video art and experimental art for like 20 years, I felt like having to do it was the first time I got it and how it was about a feeling and a sensation. So it was both, I was inspired both by the remit of the countries that were being explored and then the form that some of my contributors' works were taking. Like they were just incredibly inspiring. And I thought, I want to make something that is immersive and experimental. And I know there's an argument in my head, but I don't need it to be seen from the video essay alone because the argument's there for making me structure it but I just want it to be a feeling and a sensation. So those are the main ways, I would say, an unexpected turn to experimental film um, as opposed to my usual kind of comedy setup and payoff, which is what I used to make before. <laughs> You've screened these works. Um, and I'm wondering what, where, what was the, you know, could you elaborate more on the context and what was it, I guess, what has it been like to see these works on on the big screen, which I is obviously a very different experience from engaging with them in uh, an academic journal? Yeah, obviously, it's, um, it's really satisfying. Um, so once I started making video essays a bit more regularly before this project, I started entering them at film festivals. And um, my video essay, Knit One Stab Two, was literally played at film festivals all over the world. So I was quite familiar with working with film festivals and submitting video essays to them. And I knew for this project that I wanted it to be launched at a film festival. Because again, the project is outward facing. It's not just a bunch of academics talking to other bunch of academics in a tiny corner of discord you know it's supposed to be out there for everyone and you know horror is something that the fans always flock to it's a really kind of popular beloved genre so even at the grant application stage I'd um, got final girls Berlin film festival on board to launch it and then it finally happened you know three years later last week um so May flew over from the States, I flew over from the UK and we met in Berlin. We also got to meet one of the other contributors, um, Zainab Marvi. And Zainab's like a classic example of the ideal person for this project. So um, Zainab um, lives between Pakistan and Germany. She is a trained graphic designer who teaches at Bauhaus, who loves horror film and has not done anything academic with horror film and saw the call for papers and was like, I want to do that. And so Zainab lives quite near Berlin. So Zainab got the train over and joined us on stage to launch it. Um, because we only had a two hour slot, we couldn't screen all of them because we wanted to talk as well. So I tried to, I programmed a small selection of what I thought would be natural crowd pleasers. So like Tori's piece references a lot 
of major horror filmmakers that I know the audience will know through to just mind-bending experiences like Quan Zhang's AI piece where she uses AI to literally remake the male character in Kwai Dan. Um, so seeing them up there on the screen, sat with May and sat with Zainab, was just like a super lovely experience because it was like we made a thing guys we made a thing and the cinema that the festival was held in was absolutely huge the sound system was great and it was a proper a huge screen with a stage and then a lovely banked series of seats going up back to the projection like your proper old school proper cinema space so it felt it felt great to see it there and until a couple of years ago, I wasn't really into like pushing my research or our projects out into the world. So I was like, no, nah, they'll find a home, whatever. I'm done with it now. But I'm, I see the value in actually going out there and shouting about stuff now because the audience reception was great. And it just, it, it makes it more real as well. You know, actually sitting in a cinema in Berlin um, watching the trailer that Dana McLeod cut, watching Dana's trailer on screen, looking amazing. It, it, it's um, it's personally satisfying, I think, more than yeah. anything. And then I also do feel proud of what everybody's done. Although I got in trouble with May because I didn't screen my own work. I was like, everyone's had enough of Alison. No one needs the Alison Pierce show. We've got enough of that already. Let's just screen everyone else's instead. <laughs> one thing that I'm just thinking of now is, so I remember when your your book um women make horror um inspired a, a fantastic um series here at the museum of modern art in new york where i live where there were all these film screen and your book was for sale and i went to a bunch of the screenings it was super great and i discovered a bunch of stuff as a as someone who aspires to be like more hardcore and as a horror fan and so what these videos also do is right that it's also an active you know really curation uh and and directed oh, yeah. viewing right of yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Of, and trying to, it's trying to build an archive. Yeah. And really, put, now I'm like, I want to not only watch the video essays, I want to watch the films that are referenced here, the majority of which I've not encountered. Yeah, right? precisely. And so if you're like super geeky and into horror films, there's a whole game you can play with this special issue, which is you can go through and for each video essay, try and find the film. And some of them are easily available and some of them are not, and you'll have to do some digging. And there's kind of um, a fun, I think, and a pleasure in putting your detective hat on and going after these films and trying to find them. And it, it raises the visibility of the women filmmakers that have made it, and it raises the visibility of the films themselves. So it's definitely partly about trying to illuminate the work that isn't being written about, but now is hopefully out there and a bit more in circulation. No, and I think it really is such a powerful showcase of what you know, videographic criticism can do, right? And, and and how it can really be an ally to the to the work that it's uh, to the work that it's you know dealing with. And so, just just to to close here, what do what else do you have planned going forward for this 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 project, either for yourself or the contributors, or you know, because it will it's you know, I imagine people will be watching it over the course of many weeks and months and, and really years, you know, going forward. Yeah, well, it, it's like when we discussed it, well, in person, when we were together in Maine, and um, you were like, you know, we should you should think about doing events over the year because there's 30 video essays. It's not like everyone's going to watch them in one shot. And, I, yeah, and I think it's like more than a feature-length documentary in terms of time. So you can't watch them all in one go. Um, I've got various other um interviews coming up um we've subtitled the whole special issue all, all the videos in the special issue are subtitled in latin american spanish and brazilian portuguese as these are the two biggest languages of the global south like brazil brazilian is the main one so we've subtitled every single video essay in that so I've got a number of interviews coming up with Latin American based podcasts to try and get the word out there as well. Um, in addition, I've got a wonderful postdoc called Valeria Villegas Limval, who's also a contributor. And um, Val has 
various irons in the fire for promotion for this going forward. As I say, you know, I am quite sleepy and I am quite old now. So it's quite nice to have someone young and energetic spearheading it. And again, I don't want it to just be like the Alison show. I, I'm really great. I'm really pleased that with your podcast going forward, we've got loads of the contributors coming on to talk about their experiences because I'm at a nice position now in my career, you know, like I've got my professorship, I love where I work and what I can do now is just try and enable opportunities for other people's voices and I do really like doing that. So I'm hoping going forward there'll be lots of people being interviewed on the podcasts and not just me, um, but everybody's voice is being heard as well. Absolutely. And we'll be sure to to link to all sorts of things in the description of this podcast. And like we've been saying, this is not the end of, uh, you know, doing women's global horror film history on the Video Essay Podcast. Allison, thank you so much for, for all of your fantastic and inspiring work and for, for being with me today. Oh, and thank you for inviting me, Will. It is much appreciated. Mm-hmm.